So yes, we shall uh, fold pentagons. So foldings of uh, pentagons. And we shall do that uh, randomly, okay? So random foldings of pentagons. Okay? In fact, it's just uh, an example to start my talk. And what we will do, in fact, is we shall iterate uh, randomly um, uh, holomorphic diffeomorphisms of complex projective surfaces. Okay? So we will have a, a, a complex projective surface and uh, say two uh, holomorphic diffeomorphisms of this uh, complex projective surface, and we shall apply the, the diffeomorphisms randomly, and we want to understand the distribution of the typical orbits. Okay, that's what we are going to do. So it's part of uh, it's yes part of a joint work with uh, uh, Romain Dujardin. And it's an uh, ongoing project, so we still have questions. We don't know the answer. I mean, inside this project, even for pentagons. So let me start with pentagons. Okay. So the first example will be will be given by pentagons. Okay. So you, you fix um, five uh, positive uh, real numbers. So five length. And you assume that you have a pentagon with uh, these given five lengths. So a pentagon is just a, an ordered uh, sequence of five points in the plane. So P1, P2, P3, P4, and P5, such that uh, the distance between uh, P1 and P2 is L1, and then between P2 and P3 it's uh, L2, and so on. Okay, so the distance between P5 and P1 is, is L5. Okay, so, uh, so I'm fixing the length, and I am assuming that there is at least one pentagon with this uh, given uh, five length. Okay, but what I draw is a convex pentagon, but what I said, uh, I didn't assume that the pentagon is convex. Okay, the sides of the pentagon, they can intersect. So this uh, here uh, is a pentagon too. Okay, so it, it's not supposed to be convex, and moreover, the sides can intersect uh, together. Okay, and now on, on the space, so I'm looking at the space of pentagons with this given uh, fixed length, and I say that there is a nice uh, dynamical system on this space, uh, which is given by folding pentagons. So let me draw a picture. So you start with a pentagon. And I will define, define um, five involution on the space of pentagon. So you, you fix an index uh, j between 1 and 5. Say j is 4. So you look at the point uh, pj. Here it's p4. And you, look at, uh, and you fix uh, the four remaining, remaining points. Okay? So you, you fix the, the four remaining points, and now you will move pj. And how you do that, uh, you draw the line uh, joining pj minus 1 and, and pj plus 1. And you just take the symmetric of pj with respect to this line. And this is pj prime. OK, so the, the involution uh, index uh, j, so sj, takes a pentagon p1, p2, p3, p4, p5. And, and it moves it. So it fixes all the, the pi, uh, except pj, which is uh, changed in the second possible value for pj. OK? Uh, I mean, the formula I wrote is, uh, you should listen to me, uh, not read the formula. OK? So you have uh, five uh, involutions like that. And of course, they preserve um, the side length. So the involutions, they act on the space of pentagons with given uh, length. Okay. Okay. So the question I'm asking is the following: So you start with your, uh, with one of your pentagons that you like, and you you take a dice with five uh, faces, and you throw the dice, and each time you read the number you get on the dice, and you apply one of these, I mean the corresponding involution, and your pentagon moves when you apply the involution, and you want to understand the the asymptotic behavior of this sequence of pentagons. Okay. 
Okay, so what we are going to do, in fact, is a simpler problem. It's not for the pentagon in the plane, it's for the shape of the pentagon. So I will um, say that two pentagons are um, identical if I can move the first one to the second by a direct uh, isometry. So the space I'm looking at is a space of pentagons with this given length, modulo translation and uh, rotation. Okay. And this, uh, I say, is a surface, which I will denote by x, or x of L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Uh, x is the space of pentagons with this given length, a modulo um, SO2, a semi-direct product uh, R2, so translations and rotations. And I'm saying that this is a, a real projective surface. And moreover, the five involutions are algebraic transformations of this uh, surface. So let me write this like that. S1, S2, and S5 are uh, automorphisms uh, of x uh, defined over the real numbers. OK, so I wrote out of x index r. I mean uh, algebraic transformations which are regular, the inverse is regular, and they are defined by formulas which are, uh, I mean, with, with real coefficients. Okay. And when I say that X is a real projective surface, in some sense it's obvious that it's um, something which is uh, algebraic. Uh, you write things like uh, the distance between a point and another one is equal to something, so it's a quadratic equation in the coordinates. Okay. So it's algebraic. And what is perhaps less obvious is that uh, the dimension is two, so it's a surface. Okay. And it's, um, it's clear, in fact also it's clear because modulo translation, you can assume that P1 is the origin of the plane. Then modulo rotation, you can assume that P2 is on the positive real axis. So let me write it. So P1 now, modulo translation is zero, the origin. Then P2 is just uh, the point at distance L1 in uh, R plus, uh, in the complex uh, plane. And then what about P, P, P3? So P3 must be on a circle uh, with radius uh, L2 around the point P2, which is fixed. Uh, and P5 is on a circle around the point P1. Okay, and, and if, if you fix, I mean, there are they can move freely on these circles, but if you fix um, P3 and P4, so you, uh, P5, so you have two parameters since you have uh, two circles, then now the point uh, P4 is uh, uniquely determined up to the involution S4 because it must be at the intersection between uh, the circle centered at P3 and of radius L3 and the corresponding circle centered at P5. And, okay. So you have two circles and P4 is here. So not only I, so when I say that, I prove two things. I prove that uh, it's a surface. It's a real projective surface. And in fact, uh, you can map uh, your pentagon to P3 and P5. Each of them is on a, a conic because it's on a circle and it's a two to one cover. Okay, so in, in this figure, picture, I'm realizing my surface as a two to one cover of P1 times P1, because a conic is a P1. Okay, so that's basic algebraic geometry. Okay. And so that the question is, is that one. So now I, I want to look at the dynamics of this, uh, uh, I mean the random dynamics of these uh, involutions on my surface. Okay. Because so this was an example to justify the, the title. Okay so that I have a title which uh, has nice words like pentagon, foldings, and random. But now I will give a second example, uh, which is very similar and easier to, to describe. So it's uh, an example which has been studied by uh, Weller, and I will call this example Weller surfaces. So you take a, a surface, so I, I will denote it by X also, but it's another surface. It's in P1 times P1 times P1. Um, 
I will use coordinates, say a fine coordinates x, y, z on, on the P1s. And I, assuming that uh, the surface is, is defined by an algebraic equation, P of x, y, z is 0. Uh, with the following constraint, I want the degree of P with respect to each variable to be equal to 2. So degree of P with respect to x is 2. Degree of P with respect to y is equal to 2 also, and the same for the variable z. Okay. I'm not saying it's a quad quadratic equation because you can have uh, terms like uh, x squared times y squared times z, for instance. Okay. But if you fix y and z uh, generically, then the equation with respect to x has degree 2. And geometrically, this means that if you forget one of the variables and you then you project x on p1 times p1, then you get a 2 to 1 cover. Okay? Because if you fix y and z, for instance, forgetting the variable x, you fix y and z, uh, then you have two solutions with respect to x. Okay? So let me draw a picture. x, y, z. So you have a surface here. And for instance, if I project onto the x, y, uh, I, mean, I mean p1 times p1 corresponding to the x and y coordinates. So if I fix x and y, then there are two points. I mean, generically, there are two points above such a x, y on the surface x. So say x, y, z and x, y, z prime. And this is a ramified 2 to 1 cover. Okay, so you, you have an involution which permutes these two points. Uh, say the involution S index uh, Z. Okay? So we still have three involutions because we, we have three projections like that with the grid 2. Okay, so, so in the first example, we had five involutions. Uh, in the second one, we have just three involutions. Okay. OK, so what, what do I want to do? I want to study the, the random orbits. So uh, let me introduce uh, some notations. So I uh, take uh, the group of automorphisms of x, so holomorphic diffeomorphisms or uh, holomorphic diffeomorphisms, I mean, algebraic transformation defined over R in the first example. So I, I have a subgroup of in, inside this uh, group of holomorphic diffeomorphisms, uh, which is a group generated by my involutions. So I will uh, use just as the second example, the Weller surfaces. So OK. And now I will uh, take uh, a probability measure on this group and to be specific, I will just take a new a probability measure on the, uh, the set Sx, Sy, Sz. So the support of new is uh, this set. So the, the probability that I pick uh, one of these involutions is, is positive for each of them, and the sum is 1. And now I look at uh, sequences. Uh, of such involutions. So these are points in uh, gamma to the n. Uh, n is for z plus. So such a point I will denote it by xi. And it's a sequence f0, f1, f2, etc. Each of uh, the fi is uh, in the group uh, gamma uh, generated by the involutions. Okay. In fact, it, each of them will be one of these involutions. And now we start with a point on the surface. Okay, so for the notation, I will use uh, the following. So I will uh, say the point Q is, is in X. Or if I want to, to specify my where the point lives, um, for instance, if the equation is defined with, with, has real coefficients, then I, in fact I have two surfaces. 
I have the surface uh, given by the real solutions of the, of the equation, so it's a real surface, or I have the complex surface when I look at a complex solutions. So I will denote this uh, like that. So Q in X of R or in X of C. Okay. So say, say the, the starting point is Q index 0. And then the, when I do the, the dynamics, I have uh, Q1 is F0 of, of Q0, and then Q2 is F1 of Q1, uh, etc. Okay, so I have a sequence of point, point Qn. And the question is to understand the sequence of points uh, Qn, uh, at least for a, a generic choice uh, of, the, of the automorphisms Fi, so of the sequence Xi. And uh, the thing we can look at is uh, the distribution in probabilistic terms of this sequence, so take one over n sum from j, I mean for j equal to z zero to n minus one of a Dirac mass at point qj. Okay, so this is the empirical measure which is distributed on, I mean uniformly equidistributed on the first n terms of your sequence of points. Okay, and there is a theorem by Breiman that if this sequence uh, converges toward the probability measure mu, at least along some subsequence, and i, so and i goes to plus infinity, then the limit, the probability measure at the limit, uh, mu is a stationary measure. Okay, so. Uh, what does it mean that uh, the measure is a stationary measure? It means that it uh, satisfies the following uh, fixed point equation, which is uh, some. So you, you take your measure mu, uh, you transport it by an element of your group, f, but you weight it by the probability nu of f. So sum over f, uh, nu of f times f star mu must be equal to mu. Okay, so f in gamma. Since I suppose that the support of nu is a set of the three involutions, in fact the sum is over the three involutions. And here I, I let some space because uh, of course this is not true for any uh, xi, so for any random iteration, but this is true almost surely. So almost surely on, on xi, which means that um, uh, it's true uh, with probability one uh, with respect to the measure, which is uh, uh, new to the n. I mean the, the probability measure, which uh, models the fact that um, the fi are taken independently and identically, identically distributed with respect to new. Okay. Okay, so in fact, the uh, almost surely it comes before the then. then if they convert, yes, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, with probability one on the sequence of uh, iterates, I mean, on the sequence C, uh, the. Um, the, uh, how do you call that in, uh, les valeurs d'adhérence, I mean the limiting values of the sequence of imp empirical uh, measures are stationary measures. Okay? Okay, so the, the goal is to describe uh, stationary measures for this type of dynamical systems. So uh, dynamical systems which are, which are given by uh, random iterations of automorphisms of complex projective surfaces. Okay? And, uh, we are able to do that uh, um, at least for real algebraic uh, surfaces. So we, are, we will not, uh, at least at the beginning, I will not describe the dynamics on the complex surface, but just on the real part of the surface. So um, let me give a, a first a statement, say theorem A. So. I say for general, I will explain what general means. For a general 
uh, real weather surface. Okay, so this means again that I'm looking at one of these surfaces above with of degree 2, 2, 2 in P1 times P1 times P1 and defined by a polynomial equation with real coefficients. And I look at the real part. Okay, so and, and general means that in what I will say in a few minutes uh, means that uh, for the statement to be true. I need to remove uh, a Zariski closed set in the space of polynomial equations. Okay, so when you look at the equations, uh, p of x, y, z is zero. Uh, I, I need to remove some p uh, such that the coefficient of p satisfy an explicit uh, uh, polynomial equation. Okay, so in fact, to be more precise, in this space, for, I, I think you know that, uh, Thomas, in this space of, of surfaces, there are uh, surfaces which are uh, Kummer surfaces, so quotient of abelian varieties. And I, I need to remove this part of the moduli space. Okay. So for a general real uh, weather surface, x of r, and for any uh, probability measure, A uh, new uh, whose support is uh, given by the three involutions. And so now I take, so once, once new is, uh, is, is given, I can look at uh, stationary measures with respect to new. So I take any of them. So I take a, a new stationary measure mu on x of r, so on the real surface. And the properties are the following. First, mu is automatically invariant. So instead of being stationary, which means um, that it is uh, invariant in average, in fact, it's invariant under the three involutions. It's invariant under the group action. So every element in your group preserves the measure. Okay. Two, uh, once you know that it is invariant, in fact, it's uh, either a measure with finite support, uh, say, say a measure on a finite orbit of the group, Or it is given by an explicit uh, algebraic area form, which I will denote omega. I will I mean I will uh, I'll describe this form in a few in a few minutes. And the third statement is. Um, Moreover, there are only finitely many uh, finite orbits. When I say finite orbit, I mean for the group gamma. Okay, so this is a statement. Now let me uh, explain why it is so surprising that the measure is invariant. Uh, then I will explain uh, what is omega and uh, why the invariance of the measure implies that in fact uh, measure is on a finite orbit or is omega. And, and the third part, I, I will not uh, at all describe the proof of the part and uh, of the last part because it, the, the techniques are completely, completely different. So today we are going to do some Bayesian theory. And, and the third part is uh, proven by uh, tools from uh, arithmetic dynamics. OK, so first, uh, um, let me give an example uh, to uh, compare uh, stationary uh, versus uh, invariant measures. OK, so um, 
You see the, the, the equation, the property of being a stationary measure, it means that your, your probability measure is a fixed point for the operator, which is the average uh, when you let the group act. Okay, so you, you just look at the space of probability measure, it's a compact convex set, and you look at the operator of average sum over f, nu of f, f star. Uh, it's a, an affine transformation which preserves this compact set, so there is a fixed point in there. So there are always uh, stationary measures. Or if you prefer, you just apply Breinman theorem. Okay, so there are always stationary measures. But uh, it's I usually it's rare that uh, you get invariant measures. So the, the, the basic example is uh, you take, uh, say, lambda, a subgroup in uh, PSL2R uh, acting on the circle. Or, or if you prefer, the circle is P1 of R, projective line, real projective line. And you assume that the group is not uh, elementary. Okay, so so you have a loxodromic element in your group with some uh, north uh, south dynamics, and so if you had an invariant probability measure, then of course the probability measure should be concentrated on the, the fixed point of this transformation. But since you have many elements like that, you do not have any invariant probability measure. And on the other hand, you have at least one stationary measure, and in fact a unique one by the first and Bell theory. So what is specific here, for instance, to the fact that I'm looking at where are surfaces, is that such an example cannot be embedded in my, in my surface. So in other words, uh, one part of the statement here is that in this very specific example, there is no curve inside my surface, which is invariant by the group generated by the three involutions. Okay? Because if you had such a curve, I mean, what? So let me give you another example. Okay, assume that you have just a fixed point. So assume that there is a oh, finite orbit. So you assume you have a finite orbit. So up to finite index, you have a subgroup which fixes a point. And you blow up this point. And what you do when you do that, uh, your point is replaced by a P1. And typically what you get, the action on this P1 is, is something like that. It's a non-elementary group. Okay, so, so this type of examples, usually you find them in, uh, in projective surfaces too, with this type of example. Okay. What I'm saying is that in this specific case of weather surfaces, you do not have these curves because every invariant probability, uh, every stationary measure is invariant. So you do not have these examples. Okay. Okay, now I want to explain uh, what is omega. Okay. Okay, so in fact, um, X, in both examples, the, the pentagons or the Weyler surfaces, X, or more precisely, the complex uh, surface X of C, is a so-called uh, K3 surface. Okay, so th the complex surfaces are compact, simply connected, and what is important to us is that uh, there exists uh, holomorphic uh, two form, say omega index uh, C. So locally it's like uh, A of xy dx dy. If you have uh, local holomorphic coordinates where A is holomorphic, and the important thing is that uh, the form. Uh, does not vanish. So it's, uh, it's an area form, but in the holomorphic uh, setting. And in the example here, where everything is defined over the real numbers, in fact, uh, x of r also has uh, um, uh, I mean, this holomorphic two form, I said holomorphic, but in fact it's algebraic. 
Uh, it's I mean, it's a defined by algebraic formulas in terms of uh, the coordinates, and uh, the same is true for x of r as uh, an algebraic uh, two-form, now a real two-form, which I denote omega, uh, which does not vanish. And now if you normalize uh, omega in such a way that the integral of omega over x of r is 1, then in fact omega is unique. Okay. So it's given by algebraic geometry. I'm saying that there is a unique, uh, I mean, I mean, there is a unique section of the canonical bundle such that uh, it's, it's real and the probability, the, the measure that it defines is a probability measure. So it, since it's unique, it's automatically invariant under the action of the automorphism group. Okay. In fact, you can compute it, so let me write a formula. So if you don't understand what I said with my uh, canonical bundle and K3 surfaces and so on, it's quite simple. So you write the formula P of x, y, z is zero. Okay, and omega, uh, so now I use the coordinate x, y, z in p1 times p1 times p1. Omega is uh, dx dy divided by uh, the partial derivative of uh, p with respect to z. It's also dy over dz divided by the partial derivative of p with respect to x, uh, etc. Okay, so it's completely explicit. Question? Yeah. What is a full automorphism uh, group? So, it, it, so here it depends, okay, so... Um, depends on the P? If you take a very general... <laughs> generic, for generic P. So if you take a generic P, it's exactly the group generated by my three mm -hmm. evolutions. Ah, okay. mm -hmm. um, okay. And now, I, um, just in a few minutes, I want to explain um, how you can... Uh, so, so, so the two statements are in fact one and three. Uh, and two is just a, uh, a consequence of one. And I want to explain why, uh, how you, de you derive uh, two from one. And, and, uh, and I want to explain how you do that. And also this will illustrate another uh, specific uh, property of these Weller surfaces, okay? So let's say three, um, one implies two. So what I want to, to show is that, wh what I want to do is I want to classify invariant probability measures, okay? Okay, so I will just uh, describe the main uh, main ID. So, so let mu be a gamma invariant probability measure. Okay, so you, you look at your surface. So it's a x of r. It's a real algebraic surface. And you project it on the uh, z-axis. Okay. So if you, I, I want to look at the fibers of this. Uh, so you fix z, z0, some altitude, and you slice your surface with the plane uh, z is equal to z0. Okay, so you get a curve. And it's a curve in p1 times p1 of degree 2 with respect to each variable. And uh, what I'm saying is that it's an elliptic curve. So it's a, here it's a, it's a real uh, elliptic curve. So it's a real part of a, of a complex elliptic curve. So let me denote it by C index C0, uh, C index Z0. So it's, uh, it's this slice. And what I'm saying is that uh, the real part is the real part of an elliptic curve, or genus one curve, uh, C is a complex line that you divide by some lattice, 
but the lattice depends on uh, z0. So if you prefer the projection on the z-axis is, is a genus one fibration. Okay. And now uh, in my group, I can look at uh, G, the automorphism, which is a composition of Sx and Sy. So Sx uh, take a point xyz on the surface and, and moves the coordinate x to x prime, and Sy it moves y to y prime too. So both of them, they, they keep the z variable unchanged. So, so this automorphism G preserves this vibration. So it acts on each of these elliptic curves. And it acts as a translation, say, uh, I use a coordinate u on the elliptic curve, so u maps to u plus some t, but t depends on z0 also. Okay. And inside this complex elliptic curve, you have uh, the real part, which is, say, one circle or two circles. Okay. And so the dynamics of this specific uh, automorphism is like a, it's like a den twist, but with respect to a genus one vibration. Okay, so it twists along the fiber of a vibration. And now, if you take, uh, I mean, you come back to the real surface and you take a, a generic uh, altitude uh, z, uh, z zero. Then what I am saying is that the, you get a rotation on, on a circle or a pair of circles. And this rotation is irrational with respect to the circle. But for a countable number of uh, z0, uh, of course, it's a translation of, uh, it's a rotation of uh, angle, which is uh, a rational uh, multiple of pi. OK, so for countably many values of the height here, you get a finite order rotation. But for uh, a generic value of the height, you, you get a unique, um, and you get a, a rotation which is uh, irrational. OK, so that's the basic tool that I will use. And now uh, the proof is, is easy. I mean, if you want to understand all invariant measures, you do like that. You take your probability measure mu, and you disintegrate with respect to this projection. So you have a measure on the z coordinate, and you have measures on the fibers. For simplicity, assume that the, the projection does not have any atom. So it does not charge any of these points in the countable set where the rotation is a finite order. OK, so now you look at the measure that you get on the fiber when you disintegrate. It's a measure on a circle which is invariant by an irrational rotation. So it has to be the Lebesgue measure, the Haar measure with respect to this. So in fact, your measure in that case is invariant by all rotations. Okay, And you use that to, to, sh to show that your measure, in fact, is smooth in this uh, horizontal, uh, with respect to this horizontal vibration. Okay. Now I just use one of the projections on the z-coordinate. You can, you can project on the y-coordinate, on the x-coordinate, and you look at your measure with respect to all these uh, vibrations. And you get, you get easily the second point. Okay. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure everybody here knows how to get a proof from this construction, okay? and the fact that rotations are uniquely ergodic. But uh, wh why did I sketch this proof? It's because uh, this shows um, uh, something which is also specific to the Weller surfaces and or to the pen I mean surfaces of pentagons, is that when I compose this, I, mean, I compose uh, two involutions like I did here, uh, what I can construct are automorphisms preserving a genus one vibration with this dynamical system, which is like a twist, and I understand what the transformation does on generic fibers. But if I change my probability measure or my group, and I take, for instance, a subgroup of the group generated by the three involution, which, is, which does not contain any automorphism like that, with preserving a vibration, then I don't know how to classify uh, invariant probability measures. Okay. okay, so now I can move to the last part of the talk, uh, which is um, how do you show that, I mean, the, the first statement, that a stationary measure is in fact an invariant measure. 
Okay. okay, so what I will do, uh, so there is a, a very strong result which has been obtained by uh, Brown and Rodriguez Hertz and which uh, follows from the work of Benoit Aquin, but but in the in the setting of uh, Pethin theory for dynamical systems on surfaces. Uh, and I will take this as a black box. A and then I will explain uh, how you can uh, uh, do better by using holomorphic dynamics. So first, um, a Lyapunov uh, exponent. And uh, the work of Brown and Rodriguez Hertz. Okay. Okay, so I, I will just describe a second viewpoint on the dynamical system I'm looking at. O o instead of looking at a random dynamical system, I want to look at uh, um, some dynamical system, which uh, is not an invertible dynamical system, but, uh, but still. So I will have two. Uh, I mean, I take the product of what? Of sequences of automorphisms. So, automorphism group of x to the n, the set of integers, times my, my surface x. Okay, so in the fiber, I have uh, copies of x. Okay, and so if I take a point in this space, I have a point q on my surface and a sequence C, which is F0, F1, Fn, etc., uh, in the space of sequences. And the dynamical system is what? So, say the point is Q, Q0, and I move it to Q1 by the map F0. But then the, the, the transformation I apply next time is, will be F1, so I can forget about F0. So what I do is I do a shift on the C sequence and I map, uh, so, the, so the transformation is I shift C, so this is theta of C, so theta is a shift which forgets the first uh, element of my sequence and I map Q0 to Q1 by the map uh, F0. Okay, and now I have just one transformation of a space which is a, a bigger space, a product. Okay, so this is the first thing I do. And now I um, put some Riemannian metric on x, and I can measure the size of the differential of F0. Okay, so the, the quantity I compute will be uh, the norm of the derivative of F0 uh, at point uh, Q0. Okay. And now you iterate and you look at uh, the behavior of this quantity when you iterate n times. So I need to write it precisely. Um. So you write, uh, let's say, so n iterate for the sequence uh, xc, fn xc is uh, f0, then you apply f1, then you apply f2, up to fn minus 1. Okay, and the quantity I'm looking at is the norm of the derivative of fn xc at some point uh, q0. Okay, and I want to understand the uh, exponential growth rate of that, so 1 over n log of this quantity. And I'm saying that it converges towards some um, number which is a top or positive Lyapunov exponent of the measure as n goes to infinity. And the, the, so the convergence is for almost every sequence and um, almost n mu almost every point q0. Okay, and this is uh, Osledet's uh, theorem. Okay, so this is a, the top Lyapunov exponent. But we are on a surface, so in fact you have just one 
positive Laplinoff exponent and one uh, negative or non-positive Laplinoff exponent. Okay, so in fact we have two Laplinoff exponent. Um, since the um, since there is a, an area form which is invariant, uh, you show that the sum of the two exponents is zero. Okay. Okay, so that's the beginning. That's uh, of the Bethin theory. And then what comes with that? So assume that uh, lambda plus is positive and then lambda minus is negative. Then you can introduce the stable manifold and stable directions. Okay, so I, I'm drawing the stable direction. So the so stable direction is a line in the tangent space, uh, E uh, index S for stable, uh, it depends on what? On the, on the point Q and on the random sequence C. Okay. And so for, for mu almost every point on X and for nu N almost every C, you have such a, a stable direction. But the stable direction a priori it depends not only on Q, but also on the itinerary, uh, which is given by Xi. Okay. So if you fix Q, but you let Xi move, uh, then uh, the slope here, I mean the stable duration, uh, changes. Okay. Typically, this is what happens. Okay. Okay, so this is for the stable direction, and then you have the stable manifold. And the stable manifold here is a curve in our surface. Um, so I denote it by W, S, Q, and Xi. It depends also on, on, on Xi. And I mean, if you look at the dynamics, when you take two points in the stable direction, then asymptotically they become closer and closer. Okay. And now the, the theorem of, uh, so I, I will put uh, together uh, theorems of Le Drapier. Uh, Crowell, uh, Brown, and uh, rodriguez Etz. So in our settings, so for real weather surfaces, Uh, the, the alternative that they have is the following. So I, I, I'm staying in the same setting as uh, theorem A. Uh, weather surfaces, either mu is invariant or uh, the stable direction uh, does not depend on uh, Xi, on the random sequence, and uh, determines an invariant line field. Okay, so I mean by that, that for mu almost every point, there is a tangent line which is invariant by the group uh, action and which in fact coincides with the stable direction. Okay? And when I say, uh, I mean, everything that I wrote is uh, mu, mu almost everywhere and for nu to the n almost every sequence and so on. Okay. So can you explain what they proved exactly? Because I imagine that you are applying something to all their surfaces. Yes, yeah, so what, what I'm using is, um, um, is just what they proved and what I proved here when I classified invariant probability measures. Okay. So what, uh, what they are proving is that uh, if you take a, a nice group of diffeomorphisms of a, of a surface, a closed surface with, um, uh, I mean, some nice probability measure on it, and uh, so you need some moment condition, for instance, a finite support, and you take a, um, 
a stationary measure on the surface with, with respect to this probability measure, then um, okay, either the, uh, the measure is invariant or uh, oh, I forgot exactly the, the four possibilities. So, um, so the second possibility is uh, it's an SRB measure, but then since we have an invariant area form, in fact, it has to be the area form, or it has finite support, or, um, uh, or, it's not, or, okay, or it's not hyperbolic. So in that case, I mean, lambda plus is equal to zero is equal to lambda minus. But then in that case, you can apply the theorem of Crowell, which tells you that it is invariant. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, but this I take as a black box because now I want to, I mean, use uh, uh, two or three minutes to explain uh, how we ru rule out the fact that um, um, the stable direction does not depend on the, on the itinerary. Okay, so if we want to say that every stationary measure is in fact invariant, what we want to do is we want to say that in fact it's not possible in our case that the stable direction does not depend on C. Okay, that's what we want to do. Okay, so we want to 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 understand how this. I mean, to 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 give a criterion that says that this stable duration has to depend on the itinerary. Okay. And I will just so summarize the proof. Uh, It won't be easy. Um, okay, so now we, you can forget uh, the setting of real. I mean, here we use uh, the fact that the real dimension is two in this theorem. But now what I'm going to say uh, works for complex surfaces. Okay, so it's complex geometry and complex dynamics. Okay. So I'm, I, I just want to explain the, the main step to show that. Um, in our case of weather surfaces, this uh, stable direction depends on C. So the first step is to, to show that the uh, stable manifold uh, depends on C. Okay. So what may happen is that the stable manifold depends on the random sequence C, but they all have the same uh, direction. They are tangent one to the other. Okay. So this I will. Uh, I won't explain why you can go from being, I mean, you can rule out this tangency property. So I just want to show that WS QC does depend on C. Okay. And to do that, you, you start with something which, uh, which is in X of C. You have the stable manifold. But instead of looking at the dynamics on the real surface, I look at the dynamics on the complex surface. And I look at the stable manifold for the complex dynamics. So instead of being a real curve in a real algebraic surface, now it's a complex curve containing my real curve. And this complex curve is, uh, it's easy to see, it's a copy of C, the complex line. So it's parameterized by some holomorphic map from C to X of C. So a map eta that depends on Q and C. Okay, so that's the first thing to, to say is, is this one. The second, so you have a, a C in your complex surface X of C. And from that, you can construct a, a closed positive current. So what you do is you, you look at uh, large disks in your C and you divide by the area. So you take C, uh, sorry, eta QC of a large disk, and you divide by the area of the image of this uh, disk. Okay, so so it's it's like a, a large piece of Riemann surface in your complex surface, but with boundary, 
and weighted by the area so that the total area is uh, algebraically is one. And what you can do, you can extract a, a subsequence which converges to a, a closed um, positive current. What I'm saying is that you can take larger and larger disks in such a way that the perimeter is uh, negligible with respect to the, to the area. And when you do that, you get something which is like a, a closed uh, form, except that it is not smooth, so it's a closed positive current. And associated to this closed positive current, you get uh, a cohomology class. So, so it's, like, it's like the homology class of a Riemann surface, but it's some kind of diffuse uh, infinite uh, Riemann surface. Okay. And so from doing that, you, you go from the dynamics on the complex surface to the, to the action of the group on the cohomology. Okay. So it's a link between the dynamics on the complex surface and the cohomology. And now the second... Uh, um, ingredient, and I stop, is that you understand the dynamics on the cohomology because, um, so let me describe it for well also. Uh, the cohomology, so here you are interesting by homology class of Riemann surfaces, so, so we are in, a, let's say, cohomologically in H2 of X. Uh, with real coefficients. And this you can split in two parts. Using a uh, Dolbo cohomology. And the most important one is H11. And the classes of this closed positive current, they, they live here in H11. And in H11 you have the intersection form, which has signature plus, minus, 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 so it's a hyperbolic, uh, uh, mean, I mean, it's a hyperbolic form. And the group uh, of my Weyler surfaces acts on this space as the group of uh, isometries of uh, hyperbolic space, uh, which is non-elementary. Okay. And the fact that its action is non-elementary non uh, implies that these cohomology classes have to depend on the intermediary. You see, the cohomology classes of these uh, curves, you show that they have to coincide with uh, limit points of random sequences in this cohomology space that you understand by Furstenberg theory. Okay, I'll stop because I'm uh, over time. Uh, questions? Question: You have a, a very specific surface and a very specific group. Yes, I am uh, very specifically uh, happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, so, so the results the results we have uh, we start with uh, let X be a complex uh, projective surface with a real structure and uh, no, you do not need to assume K three. I mean, it depends what you. Okay, so uh, so. I, I try to say that uh, a big part of the work is done by this theorem above there. Okay, the theorem by uh, Le Drapier, Crowell, and then by Brown and Rodriguez Hertz. Okay, if you assume this big part, then the, what what we have to do is we have to um, to sh to sh to explain how we can control the fact that the stable manifold depends on xi. Okay, that the stable manifold really depends on the random sequence. And to show that, uh, so I just sketched the proof at the end, but to show that uh, you can start with any uh, complex projective surface, any group such that the action on the cohomology is non-elementary, and then we can control everything. Okay, so we have the good statement in that setting for this uh, fact that the stable manifold depends uh, nicely on, on Xi. Okay. Then if you want to mix uh, this argument with the ideas of Barn and Rodriguez Hertz, uh, what we have to suppose is that there is some invariant area form to get ni nice results. 
And the type of results we get is that uh, first it has to be on real surfaces because uh, the, the argument of Brown and Rodriguez Hertz, um, or the argument of Penoiquin, uh, uh, we are not able, I mean, what, what you get, uh, you have a stationary measure, you want to, to, to show that this measure is invariant. And in f instead of, of proving that the measure is invariant, you, you disintegrate the measure with respect to the stable manifolds. So you have to do that, so it's space in theory. And you show that it's invariant under a, a one-parameter group of translations. That's what we are able to, to produce. In, in a real dimension two, the stable manifold is one dimension. So it's sufficient to say that it's Lebesgue measure when you disintegrate, and then it's easy to show that it's uh, an invariant measurement. But in complex dimension two, the stable manifold are complex curves, and we just have one uh, direction of invariance. This is our elliptic curve, is in one of hmm? These are elliptic curves. No, 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 no. I'm, I, here I'm disintegrating on the stable manifolds. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing exactly the same. Okay. And so uh, we don't know yet how to conclude. We need some more invariance. Okay. So that's why uh, if we want to say that. Uh, stationary measures are uh, invariant measures. Uh, what we can do now is working on real algebraic surfaces. Okay, and then there is a third step, which, if you want to a complete understanding, is uh, the third step is uh, is to say that you understand all invariant probabilities for the group action. So this I explained for the Wheeler surfaces. And, and the important uh, thing is that when I compose two involution, I have this uh, automorphism that acts as a dent twist. And if you have that, then we can do it on any surface. But this is a strong assumption. I mean, we have that on the pentagons. We have that on the Weller surfaces. We have that on, on a generic Enriquez surface. On, but still. So yes. But yes, uh, if you just want a very general statement for groups of uh, automorphisms of complex surfaces, we don't have that. Even classification of invariant measures. So, so the group, what kind of properties does, that, does it have? I mean, does it contain Z2? Is it hyperbolic? What kind of... So it depends on the examples. I mean, uh, the, the, one, the one I focused on, the Weller surfaces, is just, I mean, for, um, for a very general uh, surface. So you take, take equation P of X, Y, Z, 0 with P of degree 2, 2, 2. P uh, very general, so uh, generic if you prefer. Uh, then the, the group generated by the three involutions is the group of uh, holomorphic diffeomorphisms and is just a free product of three involutions, no relation. Z mod 2 starts Z mod 2 starts Z mod 2. In the case, in, in the case of the pentagons, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly which group you get, but you see you, you have relations. Uh, if you take uh, two involutions that uh, do not involve uh, adjacent vertices, then uh, they commute, and otherwise they do not commute. And so you write the relation, and I think the group is that one. I, I did, I, I, I'm not saying it's a proof, but uh, I think it's so. And also, you have, uh, you, instead of folding just one vertex, you can uh, fold two adjacent vertices at, at the same time. So you get more involutions. And if you take, so you have uh, 5 plus 5, 10. 10 involutions. If you take the 10 of them, they generate a group of automorphisms. And, and we know explicitly which, uh, which group it is. When, when I say we know, it's uh, Dolgachev knows. <laughs> More questions? Perhaps uh, Alexandre? Any questions okay. in the chat or how do I... Thank you. Thank you again.